Everybody Hates Rand is a Wheel of Time podcast that will contain spoilers for all 14 books. So if you're anti-spoiler, stop this, read all 14 books, and come back. We'll be here, waiting. Our title is a joke and is meant to be taken as such. Everybody in this context refers to us and our cats. You are free to feel however you want about Rand. He's a fictional character. Please don't DM us. The world is a mess, dark one stretching out his hand. The dragon's reborn, the fire's been fanned, but everybody hates Rand. Everybody hates Rand. Everybody hates Rand. Rand. Hi, this is Everybody Hates Rand, your friendly neighborhood Wheel of Time podcast. I'm Emily Dushaw. And I'm Sally Goodman. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This week, we're talking about warfare. <laughs> you know it. You love it. It's it's war. Yeah. Uh, that's not true. Um, Tragically, we have to see it primarily through Land's viewpoint, and he is absolutely not the right person to convey the horrors of war to us. Like, can't emphasize that enough. Every time Lan is, like, referencing the glory of dying in battle, I'm like, hey, I need you, if you feel so strongly about it, to go die in battle. Ew, he's tr- absolutely trying his best. Yeah, Lan still is suicidal. Still, that's not being taken care of. Except by Algomar, who very gently sort of bonks him on the head. Algomar finally is the first person in Lan's life ever to tell him that it is selfish to just sort of march toward his death unheeding of what other people need from him. He's like, hey, yeah, your particular approach to your own death is causing problems. It's causing problems, not only for you, but for the people who are reliant upon you. And, like, it's not as though, like, a suicide is not inherently a selfish act. There mm-hmm. are a lot of uh, factors that would lead somebody to becoming suicidal. That's not what we're trying to say. Like, no blame on anybody who um, takes that route. But in this particular instance, Lan is being incredibly selfish. His sort of suicidal ideation here that is dragging hundreds, if not thousands, of men into their death because he keeps talking about how glorious battle is when he knows he has a position of influence over them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, just to... I know that's not what you meant. I just wanted to clarify. No, it is... We've talked a lot about Lan being suicidal or having suicide ideation. um, And Lan is not ever actually portrayed by this book except by this series excuse me except perhaps in the immediate aftermath of moiraine's death Mm. to be suffering from any sort of mental illness yeah he's a very rational character he um does not seem to be clinically depressed shall we say land's approach to his own death is less about like the act of wanting to end his life the way we understand suicide in modern terms as sort of a like you know giving up on life and more as a like sort of classic old-timey knight shogun whatever man wanting to embrace death as unto a lover you know it's a it's a different thing but in our modern parlance parlance suicide uh, suicidality is sort of the closest we can come yeah that's that's true i was uh probably a little off base taking us in that direction um because you're right like lan is not presented as uh mentally ill and to the best of our knowledge yeah it's Um, possible robert jordan was trying to portray him as mentally ill but robert jordan isn't good at portraying characters as anything so robert is it robert jordan isn't a good writer robert jordan isn't a good writer he's sort of only good at his only labels for character are man parentheses insufferable woman parentheses Parentheses. insufferable yeah like that's the only thing he's capable of portraying yes um so yeah we have unfortunately have to get the horrors of war through lan's point of view and lan is obsessed with his own death 
um, is maybe a better way of putting it. He is obsessed with the idea of dying for Ma- for Malkier because he has a complex about how he left Malkier even though he was when a he baby. was a adult. <laughs> when he was an infant. <laughs> we have heard so much about Malkier <laughs> while getting absolutely Malkier is giving us nothing. Yeah. We know nothing about, you know, the like glorious rise and fall of Malkier. It was referenced in the Eye of the World. And I believe ever since then, it's just been like, and that's Lane's tragic backstory, and everyone should know and acknowledge and understand that it is driving all of his actions. And it's like, no. It's possible that we get more of it in um, New Spring. New Spring, that prequel, pre- yeah, prequel book that's about Lan and Moiraine that um, you haven't read, and I read about 15 years ago, so right. I have retained nothing from it. Um, but, like, in the series proper, we have not been given enough context about Malkier yeah. to understand why um, we should care about it. Yeah. You know? It's like, yeah, okay, people, pe- people caring about their homelands when they are experiencing a diaspora is very, like, understandable and empathetic. But Lan is our single point of view character. He is from the ruling class of Malkier. Mm-hmm. Um, and that sort of, and also he's an unapproachable, unempathetic figure generally. Yeah. Which makes it really difficult to empathize with the, like, cause of Malkier. Maybe if you're a man, then that's different. I don't know. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm not a man, so I don't understand man feelings, which I know are very different. No, I'm right I on guess. board with <laughs> right on board with you what um land the Lan and malkier story is playing so much on is um to literally use this phrase the return of the king Mm -hmm. you know like we're supposed to be like it's so triumphant and it's like uh that is not only a lord of the rings thing it's sort of like a mythological archetype but um one, this is not a myth or an archetype where we are well, not a myth where people are allowed to be archetypes. I need land to be a person, be a person and exhibit feelings. And like, I think in particular, it is drawing up a lot upon imagery from Lord of the Rings, the way modern day fantasy so often does. And like that works so well in Lord of the Rings because Aragorn is a human being <laughs> who we like. Who loves horses. <laughs> yeah. He's a horse girl. He's a horse girl. He loves his friends. Yeah. He presses his head against the earth. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's so astute. We haven't really talked. I mean, we've mentioned it in passing every once in a while, but Eye of the World was so Lord of the Rings. Yes. It was just Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of like a different font. <laughs> yeah. It's just Lord of the Rings in Helvetica yes. instead of Times New Roman. <laughs> sure. Um, and... Lan is therefore just meant to be Robert Jordan's copy and paste of Aragorn. And we, in our coverage of Eye of the World, talked a lot, I believe, about the ways in which Robert Jordan doing a one-to-one of Lord of the Rings fails and succeeds in some ways. Um, But Lan is definitely one of the failure points. Lan doesn't work as a Return of the King figure because unlike Aragorn, he doesn't have jack shit to return to. Malkier is gone, literally. Yeah. It has been overtaken by the Blight. Yep. It's not, there's not going to be some like, you can come back to your country and resume, take the crown from the steward. Yeah. And come to the throne. You know, the people are scattered. We see no effort of land to try and reconnect with any of the people he's just avoiding it he's incredibly rude to most of them yeah he's like get the fuck away from me so yeah it's just not working land doesn't work yeah i think that is the the thesis of so much ehr coverage land as a character does not work absolutely doing nothing um i know he is a fan favorite for some so controversial take but i think we're right you're wrong if you like (laughs) lan sorry actually i'm not sorry you're wrong you need to address that in therapy why do you like lan is it because you're a man is it because you watched band of brothers at too young of an age yeah that'll get you (laughs) like (laughs) that is your favorite movie the godfather then you have a problem yeah 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that is in some, I mean, in a lot of ways true. Like, if you're looking at this archetype of destructive masculinity, uh, who is sort of a pinnacle of leadership, only in the fact that, like, leadership is a symbol to him. He is not actually doing anything to care for the people of his broken country. It's not like Land dedicated his life to going around helping the people of Malfier. Getting their fucking welfare benefits in, yeah. you know? Yeah, like, it's not like he's done anything to lead, to care for people. All he's doing for these people is literally leading them to their death and in some sort of last-ditch effort to recreate a symbol. Yeah, and it's really a gross. feeling of glory. Yeah, and it, so it's like... So yeah, Emily's right. If Lan is your favorite character, I think you should look at what's going on with you. Ironically enough, Lan in this very chapter um, makes fun of Tenobia, the Queen of Saldia, for glorifying and having too much like idealization about warfare and battle. Uh-huh. And the... <laughs> The sort of effect of that is just like, well, she's a stupid woman who's never actually experienced any warfare, so she doesn't understand. She doesn't understand the epic highs and lows <laughs> of high school football. <laughs> of high school football, how could she? Yeah, she's just a woman. She's just a woman. She doesn't understand the nuances of it the way I do. She's just heard too many stories, and it's like, Lan, you are trying so hard to be one of the stories. Yes, and like he tries. Brandon Sanderson tries so hard to get Lan to grapple with that nuance and just absolutely tanks it, fails. Yeah, fumbles it. Um, Lan also, in this first section, finds that his buddy Bulin, which Bueller, sorry, <laughs> Bulin. <laughs> it's just such a stupid name. I know. <laughs> Rest in peace. <laughs> Rip my guy. Bulin, who's been like slavishly following him around for the last book and a half. Bielan has no personality, except that he's absolutely devoted to Lan. Yeah. Um, he died. Lan finds his body and does some CSI on it and is like, oh, he tried to cover the wound because he didn't want me to go into battle without him. Lan has irresponsibly been going into battle more than he is supposed to. More than is safe. Um, and so that's on Lan. And B, he's like, Bulin probably didn't want to like bother one of the channelers to heal him because he wants them to save their power. Lan takes that noble sacrifice and immediately goes to Narishma and has him travel a much greater output of the one power. Bulin's body to the top of Mount Everest. <laughs> so he can be preserved. This is just like an Artemis spell. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> you're right. You got me. Everyone knows where they were when Butler died and Artemis Fowl <laughs> cryogenically <laughs> froze. <laughs> Why have we talked about Artemis Fowl when we don't watch Outlander? It's the best it series. It really of is books. so good. That moment wrecked me <laughs> for every for all of time. I know. Butler and Artemis are such a good relationship. I love you, Butler. I love you, Butler. I love you, Artemis Fowl. That moment is about the sacredness of friendship and love and life. Yes. Whereas Lan put <laughs> Lan yeeting Bulin onto the top of the mountain is once again about glorifying death. You're right. I'm sorry to bring such a, a sacred text into this. How dare you bring our holy scripture, <laughs> Artemis Fowl? <laughs> But it is so stupid. They were doing this. I, and was, I was like, like weeping with laughter. It's <laughs> so silly. And like all of this is just like a perversion of what it means to like honor the dead. Yeah, it is so incredibly important in for soldiers who mm -hmm. are experiencing war to appropriately honor the dead. Mm-hmm. Um, it's important for, like, keeping up their sense of community and morale and also for preventing um, sort of psychological repercussions after the battle. If people are able to grapple with death yeah. and loss and grief as it is happening rather than just shoving it aside and moving forward. Yes. That is not what Lane is doing. No. For the kind of, like, two instances we get of these, like, horrific perversions of what it could mean to, like, honor someone in the moment is Lan being like, going back to his stupid fucking speech from last time, being like, it is so honorable what we are doing because we are dying well. And so therefore we should tell these stories about all these 
quote unquote heroic things that people are doing that are actually just like incredibly dangerous sort of also selfish in the way that Lan is thinking about them and that they're not really getting the army a ton of gain. They're just kind of these like shows of masculinity, like charging 12 Trollocs in order to buy people a couple more minutes. And it's just like, it just, it, the, the way it's like honoring their death rather than honoring the person that they were and like the friendship that they had and the fact that it was bad that they have to die in this horrible way. Um, so that's sort of a fucked up way to be like, let's eulogize these people by talking about these honestly kind of silly things they did that yeah, got them killed. Yeah, their top badass moments. Yeah. Top 10 anime moments. Yeah, exactly. Top 10 Kakashi moments. Okay. These guys wish they were Kakashi. Yeah, you're right. Speaking Again, of, I keep bringing- Speaking of people who didn't deal with grief appropriately. <laughs> did Kakashi sit on the battlefield and remember the fallen comrades? No. No. Um, And then, yeah, this idea, this very important idea of what physically happens to somebody's body after they die, like funeral, funeral rites are very important in every culture. Like, what do you do to bodies? Yeah, how do you honor them? Something that can cause major PTSD is bodies being mutilated. Yeah, bodies being mutilated, not being able to bury them. yeah. Yeah, not ever knowing exactly what happened to them. Like, if people don't ever return, you have to assume that they're dead, but you don't have a body to do anything with so Lan just like putting Bulin on top of a mountain is just like such a perverse way of trying to get at this incredibly important ritual of grief and death and he's and is exactly what Emily's saying he's like I have to put Bulin on a mountain because god forbid I do anything right now to give him a funeral yeah Bulin does Bulin have a family does Bulin have friends who are never going to know that his body's on top of a fucking mountain. Yeah. A random mountain that yeah. Narishma chose. Lan makes Narishma... Yeah, so like, first of all, Narishma, what is this mountain? Second, Lan's like... Narishma, I made- what if Narishma chose the exact same place that Avienda and Rand went to for igloo sex? <laughs> it's just on the Shanchen continent. The igloo's still there. <laughs> Bulan's in the sex igloo. Bulan's in the sex igloo. <laughs> Marisha's like, well, I might as well get another use out of it. Sure, why not? He's a reduce, reuse, recycle kind of guy. <laughs> the three R's. <laughs> My name's Narishma, and I'm a green king. Exactly. He's Captain Planet. <laughs> <laughs> but Lan makes Narishma tell him which mountain it is, so that if Narishma dies, Lan knows. But it's like, does Lan tell anybody else? Yeah, Lan's just like, and I'll just carry that secret to my grave. One of us will have to live, me or Narishma. <laughs> might as well be me. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, just, uh, Lan's whole thing about, like, cheering people on and how they died is really just, like, um, like you're saying, a perversion of grief. It is also very much in line with, like, what states and governments prefer soldiers yes. in the military to, um, bring to warfare. Yeah. Is to think about the, like, honor of death and sacrifice rather than the horror of death and sacrifice like it serves the higher ups so much to Mm -hmm. just be like death is great and when we see it we should celebrate it because they're dying for a worthy cause Mm -hmm. rather than being like death is a complicated topic and this person might have felt that it was worth it to die in this instance to sacrifice their life in battle they may not have yeah their family may disagree with them this is a complicated issue that will never be resolved, and we have to live with that lack of resolution. And by living with it is how we accept death. Mm-hmm. Like, sorry that's so complicated. Sorry you need therapy, but you can't just wellness influencer your way into the five, past the five stages of grief all the way to acceptance. Yeah, you're right. Lan is a war influencer. <laughs> A and Rand are the most toxic, the most toxic Instagram girlies. Instagram girlies. They have a feud and it's kind of um, sexual. Um, Yeah, so that, you're exactly right. It's just the narrative we always hear coming out of what feels like American military offices in particular. Nothing better than to die for the cause of American freedom, right? Mm -hmm. She yeah. said very sarcastically. In she case said that. after watching 12 seasons of Bones. <laughs> Which is all about. We did it though, you guys. Patriotism. Yeah, we did we do it, guys. We finished it. Important update. We can move on with our lives. We finished Bones. How um, will we live? We'll have to start watching Lost again. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> Land Bad 
other things happening here. <laughs> Lan rancid. Trash. <laughs> Trash. I hate him. Wish he was dead. But that's not even like I almost wish he would just live because that would <laughs> frustrate him more. <laughs> poor Avalmar. Can we just say poor one out for that man's sanity? Yeah. Moving on to sort of like the overall mm-hmm. status of what's going on. Um, Lan and his now much um, enlarged army uh, led by Lord Agolmar, it's mostly borderlanders and rulers here, are dealing with the just like onslaught of Trollocs at Tarwin's Gap. They um, are, this is such extended warfare, you know, this is not warfare that um, even our world really knows how to cope with. Yeah. Typically how battles worked even in antiquity and like back to how you know, if we're paralleling Wheel of Time world to other sorts of worlds, or even to Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. Battles last at maximum a day or two. Right. But uh, the characters keep talking about how this is likely to stretch on for weeks or even months. Mm -hmm. And so they have to, like, make concessions for that. Um, So Agomar uh, has, like, instituted people are only allowed to go out and fight in, like, hour-long shifts. As we referenced earlier, Lan is disobeying that. And is just fighting whenever he, whenever the whimsy takes him. He's like, just, you know, gotta get my die on. <laughs> um, there are also frequent earthquakes happening, and we are going to get our first, this is a through line that we will follow through this book. There's an earthquake, cracks appear in the ground, Lamb looks at them and is like, this is particularly eerie and weird. It seems like there is, like, between the cracks, not just earth, but void. Mm. There is nothing there. There's something creepy going on here. So, cracks in the ground, point one. Put a pin in that. Clock in it. Um, Agomar and Lan talk. Agomar is talking about how, like, what they're going to do next is just they have to do a controlled retreat because, um, I can't remember his reasoning. He's basically like, we can't, there are too many trollocs, we can't hold it forever. Eventually we are going to have to retreat. Mm-hmm. Tarwin's Gap is a very, like, defensible location, as we have been told multiple times, and we don't really understand. Lan doesn't seem to really understand why they would have to retreat from it. Mm-hmm. Like, this is a bottleneck. As long as you can hold the bottleneck, that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is some sort of, like, tension going on here with Agomar and Lan. Agomar makes it about Lan's personal issues. He's like, maybe you don't want to retreat just because you came here to want to die. Mm-hmm. So think about that. And Lan's like, okay, fine. I will think about that. Um, we switch over to Edwin, who arrives on the battlefield in Candor, where they are setting up their base. We are told that uh, the Trollocs who are in Candor are, like, making their way over to Arafel. So the White Tower forces are trying to rescue refugees, blah, 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 setting up their front lines. Edwin gets a message from Elaine that's like, how do we want to handle healing? Elaine has proposed that they set up like a stationary place where people who need healing can go. Um, And, you know, a place that can be relatively well defended because we don't want their healers to get um, picked off. Yeah. So um, Edwin agrees with that and proposes that they do it in Maine, just because... It's a random place, I guess. If you're going to travel somewhere, you might as well travel to Maine. Yeah, it felt very much like, well, I guess we got to give Berylaine something yeah, to do. Yeah, exactly. So it might as well be Maine. Edwin told us that she and Gawain are now married. So. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Good for them. Who cares? Stupid. At least I didn't have to watch it. Yeah, for real. At least we didn't have to sit through their wedding for real. Um, Edwin then goes to the tent where Edgyanin and, uh, Baildoman are being kept and starts talking to Edgyanin. She's like, I just want intel on the Shanshin. And Edgyanin's like, I don't really know shit because I was in the Navy, so... So I don't know anything. And Edwin's like, I'm sure you know something that can be of assistance to me. They start talking and we leave them there. Rand waits in Elaine's tent for her to come back. And um, they have date night together. It's giving the bachelor. <laughs> it's giving <laughs> the final rose. <laughs> it's giving, what are those fucking honeymoon suites? Honeymoon suite. It's giving one-on-one. Yeah. It's giving. giving... <laughs> I love that. <laughs> 
<laughs> Elaine's like, the battles are going bad, Rand. I love that. I love that. I love that, that was a catchphrase of the most recent Bachelor, Joey. Who... And it's now my vocal <laughs> take. <laughs> Same I love that. <laughs> Um, Rand and Elaine talk about Elaine's pregnancy. Elaine's like, well, I'm pregnant. And Rand's like, whoa. <laughs> no way, dude. She's like, I think if there's a boy, I want to name him Rand. And Rand's like, please, God, don't do that. Yeah. Setting that boy up for absolute failure. And she's like, fine. And I'm like, wow, Rand's only parenting decision, I guess, is going to be an optimal one. Yeah, a pretty good one. A pretty good one. I, yeah. Woof. Well, Mary, what should we name our children? I was thinking Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> the Da Vinci Code will love this. Yeah. Been a while since I referenced the Da Vinci Code. You're right, Emily. You were doing a really good job there for a bit. I have to... And the, there's a, actually zero days a whiteboard the hanging in front of me. You don't know that. I now have to erase it. Reference. Um, Rand is doing his whole, like, philosophy, you know, his very surface-level philosophy spiel that Brandon Sanderson loves to get us about how he wishes people didn't have to die in the last battle. And it's like, (laughs) yeah, the horrors of war, this is what they are. It is so silly. Like, duh, Rand. I don't have any sympathy for this conversation happening yet again because it's like, it is a good thing that you feel bad about this, but it is not my responsibility as the reader to like indulge the fact that you feel bad about this. Handhold you through this. Yeah, we have here representing Rand and Lynn two separate sides of the same coin that is toxic masculinity. Yeah. You know, Lynn is all gung-ho about dying, death, the glory of death. Rand is like, what if nobody had to die and I could just be the only one? What if I could sacrifice myself for everyone and no one would ever have to suffer or take any action ever again? Yeah. And it's like the appropriate healthy response is in the middle somewhere there yeah that's a spectrum you guys are on two very opposite sides of the spectrum unfortunately elaine in trying to comfort rand goes more onto the land's end of the land's end the land's the land's end <laughs> she goes to land's end <laughs> and is like well people get to die if they want to rand how dare you take that from him them and rand's like you're right, Elaine. You're so wise. And it's like, hey, maybe people don't want to die. Yeah, like, have you got, has anybody at all considered that this is a bad situation? Now, no <laughs> one wants to be in the last battle. It's the last one. It's the last one. <laughs> and if you lose, it's the last of anything. It so, sucks. Like... And they're just like, <laughs> it's meh. They're just like, but it's so glorious and everyone just really wants to be fighting. And I'm like, people would probably rather fight than then absolutely be annihilated Lay down in the road for the trollocks to massacre them yeah that's probably true but like no one likes it yeah like once again it's not necessarily like a choice so much as it is the choice between doing something and just like like you said laying down and being absolutely annihilated or mm-hmm. other horrors happening to you so like not everyone is like Lan, who's like super jazzed that the battle of all time is happening <laughs> Lan is so thrilled he's so happy it's like, I'm so glad I was born now. And Rand, meanwhile, is paralyzed by, like, yeah. grief. Yeah. So neither of those is good. We need some fucking nuance in here. Yeah. Like, you can have, again, like Emily said, death is complicated. Warfare is complicated. Grief is complicated. Being alive is hard. I'm sorry to tell you guys this. Human emotion is a complicated place. <laughs> Birth is a curse and life is a prison. Yeah, you ex- know? exactly. Come on, guys. Just... Please, please. Uh, I also really cannot overstate how much this reads like a scene from The Bachelor on ABC. Like, they're so obsessed with each other in the weirdest ways. I know. So they keep that's... talking about their, like, very influential time together in Tear. Yeah. When Elaine taught Rand everything he knows about politics. And that makes me so insane because, A, that was referenced twice Yeah. in those pages. That was very much like a montage mm-hmm. sequence that didn't linger very much on them having politics talks Doing it was mostly about them smooching frenching yeah yeah so god anyway <laughs> rand's like elaine you're incredible i'm so glad i chose you you're doing an, an even better job than i could have and i'm like i'd kill him <laughs> he's so fucking condescending i know you're doing such a good job sweetie you're doing amazing sweetie you're like christian <laughs> yeah they exchange gifts again like the bachelor yeah um, Elaine 
uh, Rand gives Elaine a thing that I don't know where he fucking got it, but he's like, you can eventually make an angry out of this. Just don't do it right now because it'll weaken you in the one power. And Elaine gives Rand a tearing reel she found that she's like, this will hide you from the shadow. So I guess that'll be important in some way. The like... <laughs> and then they fuck, it is implied. Yeah, good for them. But the video, like the video game mechanic of Rand having a special item that will hide him from the shadow and him getting it right now yeah. before he goes to yeah. where the shadow lives, <laughs> goes to the town. <laughs> silly but he has it i guess um so we've had our updates from tarwin's gap from candor uh we know that e2 rald and his forces are still waiting on rand to go to shale goal and we know rand is currently fucking his pregnant girlfriend um now the camelin front we see that the Trollocs have been sort of like left the burning city and now Perrin and his forces are like harrying them in an attempt to get them to chase them hundreds of miles yeah, that to was, Sherwood Forest. Yeah, that was not clear. When they were like, there's a forest outside of Camelin, I was like, couple of miles. Yeah, great. This is the same forest that like the Borderlanders were camped in yeah. for forever. N- wrong. This forest is 150 miles to the north and it's like why were we so fucking worried about the borderlanders yeah they were then that is not close <laughs> you guys what in hell <laughs> why is this not that i'm an expert and i trust davron bashir knows what he's doing i guess but it does not feel like a feasible plan for them to run their horses 150 miles 150 miles away from us is like mid idaho i know like that's like fucking halfway to saint george yeah that's some Utah geography lore <laughs> for the people. <laughs> but it's like in another state. Yeah. That's, that's so far away. I would not be worried about an army in Idaho. I know. Gareth Brand was like, I used to agonize over armies hanging out in Sherwood Forest. And it's like, girl, you, would you shouldn't have. You see them coming. I don't yeah. understand this at all. This is so confusing to me, but I'm not Sun Tzu, so... Anyway, Elaine and everyone else are just waiting in this forest for this maneuver to work elaine's like maybe i should go check it out and brigitte's like i'll fucking end your life no. pregnant or not so <laughs> stay sit the fuck down um uno comes along and gives um an update on candor just because he's the messenger i guess then leaves elaine goes to her sort of command tent to meet with the others where she gets an update about uh tarwin's gap and bashir's like Agomar wants to do a controlled retreat. Elaine, like Lan, is like, I don't think we should do that. And Bashir's like, well, Agomar has experience and is a good general, so you should probably listen to him. And Elaine's like, okay. I am I am bringing this up for a reason. So. Oh, no. If that will help, oh. if that will help you guys keep a, keep a pin on that one. That's another thing to keep a pin on. Okay. Um, but... Uh, they're still waiting when we leave Elaine and go over to Andrel for a page. Update from Andrel. Still in that basement. <laughs> this is the most efficient page in the yeah. whole of a memory still of in life. That, still in that basement. <laughs> Every word of it was really necessary. Hey, by the, by the way, basement time. With yeah. Andrel. Basement time with Andrel. I Andrel's mean, like, it's fucked. We're all drugged on Fork Root. Uh, Marin are, you know, the sole carrier of LGBTQ representation in this series. Luckily has not been turned to the dark side yet because he has more willpower than that teen boy, I guess. You'd have to be to be a closeted gay. <laughs> to be the only gay person on the entire continent. Yeah, he should have more willpower than Loghain is all I'm saying. Yeah. But Amarin hasn't been turned yet, Loghain hasn't been turned yet, and <laughs> Andrel is like, the conference room full of Murdral is getting upset. Yeah. Everyone is tired. Yeah. And Mazram Tem is really cracking the whip. Yeah. They <clears throat> have come they have come upon a new strategy, which is to grab one of the Aes Sedai that Loghain forcibly bonded, Tovin, who we've had a few view, uh, points of view from. Yeah. And they're going to turn her. Tovin is like red Aja and kind of evil to begin with in the sort of like she's a jerk but not necessarily a dark friend so i believe we can assume she will go quickly yeah um that's oh 
Also important, Andrel notices Tem looking at a little object in his hands shaped like a disc. What could that be? What could that be? <clears throat> <clears throat> seal watch, too. <gasps> there are seals now. Or far, 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 far there. But I we wish... don't. We know of no other objects shaped like discs in this series. Yeah, no, no CD ROMs. Yeah, there's no fucking DVDs. <laughs> He's holding a DVD. Block How Buster. to turn people? A guide. <laughs> um, switch back to land at Tarwin's Gap, where the Trollock army is suddenly backed up by a bunch of bad guy channelers. Nourish was like, I estimate there are like twenty. Land's like, can we do anything? Nourish was like, not really. You know? Yeah, this is bad news. And Agamar's like, well, sweet, now we retreat. And they do. Back to Elaine as the other force, fi- parents forces finally succeed in bringing the Trollocs to Sherwood Forest. We're calling it Sherwood Forest because Elaine asks Burjeet, um, weren't you like a bandit here robbing the rich? And Burjeet's like, yeah, of course I was. And Bitch. Elaine's like... <laughs> You robbed the queen, and Brigitte was like, she was a bad queen. And Elaine's like, it's the principal. And Brigitte's like, yeah, I agree. It, it, is, was, it was the principal. It was the principal of the matter, Elaine. For which I robbed her, so shut up. And I'll rob you if you don't stop talking. And I wish she would. Um, despite Brigitte holding Elaine back from going to look at Camelin and what was going on there, it sure seems like Elaine is just on the front lines here like she's literally calling orders which isn't very is mostly just like stupid because her orders aren't good like at one point she's like archers you need to hold and tam's like no they should shoot right now and she's like i don't know about that and tam's like well which of us has ever fired a bow (laughs) tam being like is it okay to kill the mother of my grandchildren in law problems already with this woman. <laughs> uh, R.A.P. Tam. Um, so, like, Elaine is just, you know, mechanically um, calling orders so that we know what's going on because it's easier than just describing it. But I sure wish it was someone who actually knew what they were doing calling orders. Like any of the military guys on the battlefield. Like fucking Bashir or Tam or anyone. Matt's dad is also here. He's not seem yeah, to be Matt's doing anything, but he is for here. Some reason. Anyway, the Trollocs are led straight to the Band of the Red Hand. Talmanese is back in business, by the way, in case you were worried. Um, and um, they just fire the cannons at the Trollocs. And Elaine is, you know, absolutely decimate them. And Elaine's like, whoa. And Brigitte's like, whoa, in a bad way. Yeah, Elaine is like, whoa, parentheses, delighted. Brigitte is like, whoa, parentheses, horrified. Repulsed, yeah. yeah. And Elaine's like, this is the end of war. If everyone has these weapons. <laughs> and it's like, you're telling me this bitch is the general of... She's like, nobody will go on the battlefield because these weapons are so horrible. Nobody will want to get risk getting blown up. And it's like, Elaine... P- you think they want to risk getting gutted by a sword? That's not yeah. a fun way to die either. Do you think people want to get et by Trollocs? Yeah. Which is constantly implied in this series, by the way, that people are just getting et by Trollocs. Yeah, just constantly getting eaten, snatched, possibly eaten alive. Just like truly horrific gross. things. Yeah, gross, nasty stuff. Like it's also not pleasant to get shot by a bow or die in any of these other horrible ways. All of warfare sucks and is bad, so, Elaine, Elaine. But you wouldn't know that. No, because Elaine doesn't think that archers should shoot when they can see their target, but whatever. Um, So is this the stupidest thing Elaine has ever said? It's like top five. Yeah, at least. A real contender. Burjeet's like, maybe I'm just cynical. And it's like, no, Burjeet, you just understand. You just understand that, unfortunately, like you can't unring the bell, you know? Like this is not going to stop warfare. This is only going to make it worse. It's a bad thing. Thing. And also to bring in some of our like real world experience of what happens when there are weapons of mass destruction, it is a way for people to make money. So people do things called war profiteering yeah. and make wars happen so that they can sell cannons to each other. We Elaine? just saw Bale where the figure, the allegory for war profiteering yeah. was a French mine. <laughs> I forgot about that. 
Yeah, he was a little French mime that would come on stage. Okay, he wasn't literally a mime, you know. He didn't have the like white face, uh, pink striped shirt. Can but he say had... that he was French? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he gave French vibes. <laughs> Actually, what he gave was Swiper the Fox from Dora the Explorer vibes. Yeah. He yeah. was like, and he had did have a bowler hat. So. Yeah, he was dressed like a French mime. Yeah, but we are. That's a total aside. It was so wild, though. Yeah. We were at that ballet, like, what? Like, it was generally a very good, though very upsetting ballet, but every time he came on stage, I was like, of all the ways to dress war profiteering, as a little swiper, no swiping man. As a little, yeah, (laughs) weird fox man. Um, okay, that's those couple chapters all about war, you know? Yeah. I think Talmany's should have been laid up for this entire book. He for sure should have. I, if he wasn't going to die, then he should Yeah, have it's really annoying that they're like, haha, fake out. We, you thought Talmany's beefed it. Just kidding. Now he's back valiantly leading a charge of cannons. Mm-hmm. And you're like, I thought he almost died like three days ago. Okay, we are next going to be reading three chapters. Um, a lot of that is just going to be continuation of the plots that are going on already. War. Dying. How do we deal with people dying? But we are going to have our three main boys also doing relatively important things. Matt, we're going to catch up with his first point of view, 240, nope. Yeah. 246 pages into this book, we will get Matt on page for the first time. Um, Perrin is going to decide to take an action that is not just fighting. Wow. Um, And Rand is also... Not going to jail goal, but he's going to do some stuff. He's going to, like, do frontline fighting oh. just to sort of do it. He's delaying going to jail goal for narrative reasons and, I believe, personal reasons, but I can't remember. <laughs> I guess hopefully we'll figure that out. But that's what's on the docket. Okay, thanks for listening. Thanks to Glenna McKenzie for our theme song. Thanks to... Uh, our patrons on Patreon and our followers on social media. Yeah, you guys are the best um, to do a Patreon shout out. There's a new Patreon feature called Chats, where just like everyone on our Patreon can just like be in a, what is effectively a large group chat. Oh. Um, so I've been playing uh, around with it a little bit. I don't understand it all that well because I am old, apparently, um, but have been uh, chatting in there with some folks, which has been really fun. We've been talking about books and various things. So cool. if you are on our Patreon and you want to come chat with us, um, it has been really nice. Yeah, so it sounds like kind of like a Discord server. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, that's exactly right, Emily. That's better than a group chat. So. Uh, come check it out if you're on our Patreon or if that intrigues you. Come check out our Patreon. We're, uh, we're there. Yeah. So are these guys. Yeah, the cats feature hev- heavily in the blooper reel. Um, do you have a sign off? <laughs> I do. Um, I am doing a big project at work. I'm not really doing anything. I'm just kind of on the review committee for a big project at work. That involves every few weeks sitting down with a consultant because the project is so large and complicated and it has to do with like a regulation change at the federal level. So it's just like really several regulation changes at the federal level. So it's just really complicated. But anyway, it's like a very important project. And in these meetings are like my direct boss, my boss's boss, another high up person in our agency and our consultant who like we're supposed to put on a nice front four and this meeting is always at nine in the morning so i feel like a a total piece of shit on an average week and uh i hadn't i usually drink tea in the morning i hadn't finished drinking my tea so i walk in it's a virtual meeting i I, you know metaphorically walk into this meeting and start drinking tea out of my naruto mug (laughs) (laughs) um and I was like, I don't know if anybody would like know that it was a Naruto mug or know what that is, but I felt like a jackass. <laughs> I love that mug. It's a great mug, which is why I picked it up. There's but... nothing more professional than Naruto. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was the Ichiraku ramen mug that I have, which is... They were probably just like, this bitch loves ramen. <laughs> like Naruto himself. <laughs> I mean, the Ichiraku Ramen Man is a very successful businessman. Yeah, so. he's yeah, a small business owner. Yeah, a small business king. And probably the backbone of the Leaf Village, Konoha, if we're yeah. being honest. Yeah, so 
he, mess, he makes more money than anyone we ever see. Yeah, that's so. true. Everyone else there is unemployed. <laughs> it's the only business in Kona <laughs> Um So that was just my sort of silly moment of ah, the week. I think that's great. Okay, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye.